Hi guys, good morning. Um, welcome back to the continuation of the lectures on electrodynamics. <clears throat> Again, our uh, main reference for this uh, series of lectures is um, the introduction to electrodynamics by David J. Griffith. And as recommended, uh, uh, you buy this book when you have um, extra resources. Uh, for now, um, I'm sorry that um, that the presentation is blinking. I, hope, uh, I know you're bothered by it, but um, I hope you can bear with it. Um, it's actually caused by StreamYard. <clears throat> And um, so I'll be making a roll call. Um, good morning to Hosni, Michael John, John Oliver, Marsden, Lycogen, Anna Faye, um, Jovin Steve, Liza May, Rena May, um, Jay, Jezreel, um, Era, Melba Grace, Wells, um, uh, Joven Steve, uh, John Kester. So I think that's all. If I am miss someone just uh put it in the chat so um here <clears throat> we discussed about uh, gauss law in the previous um lecture and um in this lecture uh we will continue with an example um of gauss law uh by the way i hope you have answered the assessment of the pre previous lecture, and um, hopefully you'll be able to submit all of them next week. So for, for the assessment of this, just um, wait for my announcement in the Google Classroom or in the Molly Classroom. So um, let's um, <clears throat> let's continue with. Um, um, example 2.4. So there's an infinite plane, an infinite plane carrying a uh, uniform uh, density, surface charge density, meaning the charges are distributed uh, all over, I mean, all throughout the, the surface, and it's called sigma. Find its electric field above or, yeah, just above the surface. So in this uh, example, you draw a Gaussian pillbox. I told you last time that you can exploit the symmetry of a given charge distribution by Ga uh, Gaussian surface uh, that are symmetric also, like a spherical Gaussian surface or cylindrical Gaussian surface, or <clears throat> in this case, Gaussian pillbox. So, um, wait. Um, so, in this case, you have a Gaussian pillbox, and the Gaussian pillbox is, um, extending equal distance above and below the plane. So you have, a, you have a thickness here from the surface, and then you also have a, the same thickness below the surface charge um, distribution. This is the surface <clears throat> charge distribution here. That is the surface charge distribution, and this is your, this is your pill box here. That's your pillbox. 
So the pill box is like a, a box, a rectangular box with a surface area A above, of course, and that's the same surface area below. The sides are all also rectangular, but you have a, a, a surface that's perpendicular to the surface charge distribution, the sides of the pill box. And you have two sides of the pill box that's uh, parallel to the surface uh, charge distribution. <clears throat> so if you apply Gauss law, well, of course, Gauss law is this one. And um, your electric field here, the electric field, since uh, we are assuming that the that the charge distribution is positive so uh, from from here uh, let me just go back from here this the electric field or the field coming coming from positive charge uh, goes out goes out of the positive charge and when you have a negative charge the fields goes in so in in the problem uh, it was not specified if it's positive or negative just assume that uh, the surface charge density given by sigma is uh, positive so that the electric field here all of the electric field will be going up on this surface, so all will be going up. And below the charge, below the charge density, that I mean the surface charge density, below the distribution of the charges, you have also fields going down. You have fields going down here. So that's the fields are perpendicular to the fields are perpendicular to the surface charge density. So above it's going up and below it's going down. Uh, we assume that the surface charge density is positive, so the electric field spreads out of the positive charge. When it's negative charge, it's, it goes to the charge. I mean, the, the electric field will con converge to the charge. In this case, <clears throat> how many sides does a pill box? There are four sides in the pill box that is perpendicular to the uh, perpendicular to the surface charge um, surface charge uh, density or surface charge distribution, and there are two sides of the pill box, the one that's parallel above and the one that's parallel below. So here, um, the area, if you get a patch of area from here, the patch of area will have the direction that way. And below, the patch of area will have a direction this way. Um, <clears throat> wait. So this uh, this is the 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 directional. Um, this is the direction of the area, the patch of area, directional area. You have here um, going up, and then below is going down. The electric field, as I've said, is going up here and the electric field is going down here so what can you say about the direction of the patch of area in the electric field remember that th this plane is <clears throat> this surface charge distribution is infinite this extends to infinity there going there and going there 
going here, that extends to infinity. Meaning that uh, wherever you go in the plane, the field will always be in the direction upward. You walk on the plane. And if, you, if you're below the plane, the field will always be going downward. So the direction of the DA, which is uh, the directional area or the direction of the patch area, uh, patch, uh, patch of area is zero with respect to the angle uh, is zero with respect to the field because they're always parallel on the sides on the sides of the field box the direction would be this way or that way the size of the field box the, the patch of area i mean on the size of the field box will be on that way <clears throat> so how do they compare with the direction of the electric field the direction of the electric field is always upward or downward and so the patch of area will have a of, of patch of area on the sides of the field box will have a dire direction perpendicular to the electric field so um, the angle there between them is um, 90 and so the patch of area on the size of the field box will contribute nothing to the Gauss uh, Gauss law so in this case if you break down this close integral it will be composed of six surface integrals. Two for uh, one for the upper surface and one below, one below, and then four side surfaces. But the four side surfaces will contribute nothing because the cosine of 90 here, the dot product, this is dot product, E dot DA, that's cosine, cosine theta. But the theta there for the sides is 90. Cosine 90 is equal to zero. So they will contribute nothing. Only, only this surface and the surface below. Because the angle between um, the surface above and the, the angle between the directional area above and the electric field is zero. And also the same below it's also zero so cosine of zero is equal to one so how about <clears throat> so that's for for this side of the gauss law how about this side of the gauss law we look at the uh charge enclosed the charge enclosed you have a you have a surface charge density that is uniform here so the infinite uh, plane has a uniform charge, surface charge density. That means that the charge is uh, evenly distributed throughout the surface. That means that if you divide the charge over the area, that's constant, uniform charge density. So your charge is equal to or the charge enclosed by this area is equal to sigma times the area. Sigma is charge per unit area. So this is this is your um, Q enclosed. This this is the integral of sigma <clears throat> sigma uh, dA Q enclosed. Integral of sigma dA. Sigma is uniform, so that is constant. You can take that out of the integral. So you, ha you have a remaining integral of dA. And the integral of dA will just be the total area. The integral is just the total area. So you can replace this. You can replace this Q with um, sigma A. where A is the area of the lid of the pill box. This is the, the area A. It's the same area below. <clears throat> so, 
So it's the same electric, the, sa the magnitude of the electric field above and the magnitude of the electric field below will just be the same. So if you add the contributions of the two surfaces, that would be this one. The other four surfaces will contribute nothing, as I said. So E that dA will be equal to two times the total area times the electric field. The electric field magnitude is um, constant. So that one is equal to sigma A over epsilon sub O. This is um, Q enclosed is equal to sigma A. So that's uh, this, this one is your Q enclosed. So therefore, your electric field, if you do the manipulation, your electric field would be sigma over 2 epsilon sub O in the direction N, where N is pointing away from the surface. So <clears throat> your electric field will be uh, of this um, uh, magnet of this expression. But of course, this is not the expression if the the plane is uh, not infinite. Th this is this is only for infinite plane, or this is only when you are very near the surface of the plane. When you are very near the surface of the plane, the plane will look like it is infinite. So your electric field is equal to sigma over to epsilon there when you're very near the plane. But if you're far away, if the plane is infinite, if, if the plane is not infinite and you're far away, the plane would just look like a point charge. So it's uh, it's different uh, case for infinite plane because if you're on an infinite plane, when you go up away from, from, from the plane, you will still see the plane to be uh, infinite. So when you go farther away, it's still infinite, so the electric field will not change and the electric field will just look like this. So this one, so this expression, this expression is only true when the distribution of charge is infinite or throughout the surface area or if you're very near the plane the surface uh, you're very near the surface of uh, surface charge density I mean. and n of course is the normal normal unit vector uh, uh, normal unit vector to the plane <clears throat> so that's it for that example. I hope you got that because you have to write that. And the next example would be um, two infinite parallel planes. They carry equal but opposite uniform charge densities. So here. <clears throat> so it looks like a capacitor. It's a... Uh, one plane is positive and the other plane is negative. So it's like a capacitor. But uh, in this case, you have two infinite parallel planes. So it, cannot, it couldn't be a capacitor because there's no capacitor that exists uh, at infinity. Or I mean, an infinite capacitor doesn't exist. So um, but this looks like a capacitor. Um, you have two infinite parallel planes carrying uh, uniform uh, charge densities, but they are in opposite charge. So now you're asked to find the field in each of the three regions of uh, the two infinite planes. So say, what is the electric field in region I? What is the electric field in the region uh, to II and the in what is the 
uh, field in the region III. So in the first region, looking at figure 2.4, in the first region, the positive, um, positive distribution will produce a field going here. And um, of course, it will also produce a field that's going here. So that's the that's the the field it produces. In this region, of course, uh, this um, distribution will produce a field going in this uh, direction also, because uh, it's going away for for the positive charge. For the negative charge, the electric field will converge to the negative charge. So it will produce in this region, uh, this negative charge density here, so which charge density, will produce a field going in this direction. And also, it will produce a field going in this direction. And of course, um, the same as in this uh, region I. So what happens in the region I, the two electric fields will cancel because they are opposite in direction. In the region II, they uh, connive or they, they add up because they are in the same direction. So, you have uh, an electric field in region two. In region region three, you have a field that's canceling each other as well. So in in the in region one and three, the field is zero. But inside <clears throat> inside um, the region between uh, so the surface charge densities, uh, positive sigma and negative sigma, you have a re reinforcement of fields, meaning you have sigma over 2 epsilon plus sigma over 2 epsilon, but the direction is going to the, in this case, it's going to the right, because uh, the electric field would have to go to the negative charge. Uh, if you interchange, if you interchange the negative and positive charge, of course, the direction of the electric field will also change. So that's uh, the electric field inside. So in other words, so in other words, the electric field, so in a capacitor, if you look at it, there's no electric field outside the capacitor. The electric field is only inside the capacitor so there's no electric field here so the electric field will go here it's just here inside so the electric field by the way electric fields uh, store um, energy so that your capacitor when you have electric field inside it stores um, um, energy you can only store energy when the two uh, when the two surfaces have charge i mean have charges so they'll have charge uh, distribution as well <clears throat> so a capacitor can store energy when the plates the two plates have uh, charge densities and of course these charge densities will produce the field that's also synonymous to uh, stored energy. So this is just the this is just the solution of the of this problem. By the way, um, um, the field is um, sigma over epsilon sub O because you're adding two fields here. Sigma epsilon, sig, sigma over two epsilon sub O plus sigma over two epsilon sub O. 
And there are problems here that you can do. And someday uh, I'll tell you to solve some of them. But um, for now, just enjoy the assess assessment of the lectures. Um, you will also encounter good to solve this problem because um, it, you, it will be a learning experience for you. And uh, if you don't know how to solve them, you can ask me. You can, you can write your solution and then when you, when you come to a point that you cannot go on with the solution, then you can ask me, how can I go on? So just take a picture of your solution and then you can um, post it in our um, classrooms. There's also another problem here. You have a hollow spherical shell which carries charge density rho. And in this case, your charge density is not um, constant. It's uh, dependent uh, with R. So you have a row that's K over R square. And R, if it is small, the charge is, uh, the, the density, charge density is big. And when it goes farther away from the center, it decreases. So there's also another problem here for uh, involving a long, coaxial cable these coaxial cables are actually found in in our cable wires in our tv cable wires in our internet um you you can see them so there's uh I mean, there's a real application to this cable cable coaxial cables there's also this problem. <clears throat> you can screenshot this. And also this problem, you can you can also solve this. This problem. So before I continue with a curl of the electrostatic field, I'll write something in the chat. So let's now go to the uh, curl of E. The curl of the electrostatic field. So um, again, considering as the simplest configuration, uh, considering a point charge at the origin, um, I, I, before I, I hope you understand some, some points, some important points of the Gauss law. Um, 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 so here you have uh, the curl of E. So again, you consider a point charge at the origin. The point charge in the origin will give you an electric field. A uh, point uh, E, R distance from that charge, equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon Q over R squared in the direction R hat. So this is the electric field. The direction of the electric field is fragile. So in this case, if you integrate by line integral, you get to uh, integrate that field by dotting it to a DL uh, from point uh, A to B, for example. So if you move away from the charge, if, you, if you're moving uh, with respect to the charge, 
So you're starting from point A, then you move to point B. So if you're at point B now, you're in a different distance from the charge, from the charge at the origin. At A, you also have a different distance from the charge. So if you look at this figure, so at point A here, you move to point B. Uh, so your distance from the charge Q, RA has now changed to RB. Okay. And uh, the, the direction of your electric field is always radial. So your D, DL here <clears throat> in spherical coordinate system, your DL would be this one. But uh, when you dot it with E, when you dot it with E, you only dot with this component because you don't have uh, an electric field whose uh, direction is theta hat and whose direction is phi hat. So this part of the BL will be dotted to zero and they will not contribute anything. So only this one here, only this one. So that when you have D, E that BL, you will have um, only this. Okay, so. Now, you integrate um, E dot BL from A to B, from A to B. So 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub O would be constant. You can take that out of the integral. Uh, of course, then you have to integrate Q over R squared dr. So Q over R would be the integral of Q over R squared. That's negative, I mean, negative Q over R. Q is also constant because uh, it's, of course, um, uh, the charge at the origin doesn't change. So you can take that out of, of the integral as well. So what happens here is that <clears throat> your electric, uh, your integral depends only on the endpoints. Uh, your depends only in your RA and your RB, your distance, the initial distance and the final distance from the charge. So when you go back, if you, if you start initially from A going to B, and then you go back to A, you go back to A in this direction, um, of course, this is also in that direction. Your final distance would be the same as your initial distance. And so your close integral, close, uh, close path integral would be equal to zero. Because uh, now your, your initial and final points are the same, and so they're still the same uh, distance away from the charge. So your closed integral, closed path integral would be equal to zero. And by applying Stokes theorem, wherein this is equivalent to the, this is equivalent to the, the curl of the vector that dA. Um, where it is integrated over the surface area bounded by the um, by the this path. <clears throat> so if you have a a closed path, you are enclosing the area an area that are, an area there, and um, that area is of course. Um, has an associated surface. So that surface, <clears throat> when, the, when you integrate the curl uh, with, with respect to that surface, 
or over that surface is the same as integrating the, the field or the vector with respect to the or over the path enclosing that surface. That's the Stokes theorem we have discussed in, in the previous chapter. <coughs> So um, that's the that's the meaning of this. Um, I mean, that's the essence of this um, uh, part of the lecture. So since um, th they are equal, so therefore um, the curl of E, the curl of E is equal to zero. What does it mean? The curl of E. That means that it doesn't curl at the charge. It will only diverge. <clears throat> the field will only diverge from the charge, but it doesn't curl the charge. If you have a curling of the field, it will curl the charge. But in this case, the electric field only diverge from the charge. So if you have a charge, that's at the center, the fields will just diverge there in radial direction, but it does not curl. It doesn't make a whirlpool. So that's um, the meaning of um, del cross E equals zero. So, <clears throat> there's um there's a statement here the proof of uh, equation 2.19 and 2.20 is only for the field of a single point charge at the origin but this results does not um but this result makes no difference, I mean, reference to the uh, choice of coordinates. And no matter where the charge is located, it gives the same answer. It's still zero. So if ever the charge will be located here, if the, even if the charge is located there, um, the curl would always be zero and the, the closed integral of the electric field will, will always be zero. Because uh, if, uh, if your charge is located here, so your RA, your RA would be here and your RB would be here. So it doesn't matter. The location of Q doesn't matter. Also, from the uh, principle of superposition, it states that when you have an electric field coming from one of the charge, and then you have another charge that's exerting another electric field, and then you have another charge also exerting an electric field, what you feel at the point is the combination or the sum of those fields. And so if you so if you take um, the curl of the electric fields of, of the, I mean, of the sum of the field, we, you will have this. You will have this. So the curl of the sum will just be the, the sum of the curls of each of the fields. So that's also equal to zero. So that means that um, this equation, this one, whether it is for whether it is for discrete or continuous distribution of charges, holds true. So it holds true for discrete and continuous distribution for any static charge distribution. So whether it's um, there, are, there's only one charge or many many point charges or a, a continuous charge distribution. 
So, <clears throat> what's actually, what is actually, um, um, not good with calculating electric field is the direction that the electric field carries. It's so messy in the calculation. Um, so, um, so uh, they are making some simplifications to the simplifications to the um, to the problem by taking the scalar uh, that causes the electric field, uh, and this scalar is called electric potential. You know that the curl of the electric field is always zero. The curl of the electric field is always zero, and um, that is a requirement that um, the electric field is actually a vector um, equal to a gradient of a scalar. So if you have this, if you have this, then you can write the electric field as a gradient of a scalar. What is good with a scalar and what is not good with a vector? The vector carries direction and a scalar is nothing but an ordinary function without direction. So can we write the electric field as a, I mean, what is the associated scalar of the electric field? Remember, electric field carries direction. In the sphere, it's radial. In the um, in the Cartesian coordinates, you have x, y, z. Or in the cylindrical coordinates, it has it's also radial. So we define uh, the scalar that produces the electric field uh, when you take its gradient. So um, so as, as, as I have said, electric field is always zero. And uh, we can exploit that property in order to find the scalar associated with that electric field. So um, uh, looking back at the integral here, <clears throat> looking back at the integral. If you start from A going to B, the integral of E dot DL is not zero. But if you go from, but if you go from A to A, that's equal to zero. Or from B to B is equal to zero. So this means that the value of the integral from a to b is is uh, some value could be negative or could be positive that's going from here to here if you go from from b to a the value of that is the same as from going uh, a to b but the sign is opposite because they have to add up to zero. So if you have a value of negative five here, so if this negative five here, this negative five there, the value here should be five. The value here should be 5. So that when you add negative 5 and 5, it's equal to 0. So there's a there's a there's a, a value if the if the path is not closed. And that we call the electric potential. <clears throat> we call that uh, the electric potential. But the electric potential, in this case, has a reference point um, here. We have uh, a reference point. 
the reference point is denoted by O. That's uh, uh, that the O could be somewhere at infinity, the O could be at the origin, or the O could be somewhere between infinity and um, infinity and the origin. But the O should be um, you should be consistent with the O. So if your reference point is from infinity, it should always be at infinity. Or if your of your if your reference point is at zero, then it should always be at zero. Or if your reference point is somewhere between infinity and zero, you have to stick with that reference point. But um, don't confuse yourself. Most reference points are um, are uh, set to infinity. That means the reference point at infinity, you will have potential or electric field at infinity to be zero. Why? Um, when you have a charge or when you have a distribution of charge, when you are very near the charge, you will feel strong electric field because the distance between you and the distance between you and the charge is very small. So you will feel a strong electric field. But if you go far away, you go out of the earth, going to some point in the universe, and you will that point of uh, that um, distribution of charge will just become a point uh, getting smaller and smaller and smaller and the effect becomes zero at infinity so um, at infinity you can set the reference point and the electric field there is zero or at some some problems will have they will tell you that uh, some problems in electrostatics will tell you that uh, choose the reference point to be um, uh, to be zero at zero zero at x equals zero but most if it's not most problems if it's not stated the reference point would have to be infinity and where uh, the field and the potential at infinity would be zero so in this case, you have an electric potential, and this is um, uh, computed from zero to infinity. This is actually this is actually positive. If you change the this is positive. You change the direct. If you change the order of the limits from from zero to r to r to zero, because uh, from from, Z, from O to R or R to O. O is the infinite reference point. And this is, of course, larger than R. So that's why the negative comes out here. But if you if it's from R to infinity, then this is positive. So it's just a matter of the ordering of the limits. So <clears throat> now, um what is the potential difference between what is the potential difference between two points a and b what is the potential difference so this is what is the potential difference between this point and that point? so you can compute you can compute the potential difference and this is just um um this is negative uh from o to b for the for for this one for this one you have that one and then you have minus negative uh from negative integral from o to a of E dot DL, so this, this becomes positive here. This is minus negative of, so that's uh, negative times negative is positive. That one. 
And so if, the, if you change the order of the limits here, if you change the order of the limits here, um, this will become a uh, negative. So if you change the limit from uh, A to, uh, from, from O to A, then you will have a negative uh, with limits A to O. <laughs> so this is like uh, integrating the same quantity. Looking at this, you have, uh, you have, you're integrating the same quantity here with different limits, but the limit is continuous from B, the limit here is from B to O to O uh, and O to A. So that you can write this, you can write this as um, just the negative integral of E dot DL from A to B. So your your potential difference is equal to this equal to that. No, here um, the the electric potential is this one. The potential is that one. You have your limits is infinity to the point a that's the electric potential at a point at a point r but if you you're talking about potential difference you have two points a and b <clears throat> you have two points a and b and so your limits here would be from a to b okay by the way uh, according the, to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we studied in the first chapter, this, this potential difference, uh, VB minus VA, is just equal to the, to the gradient of V, that DL, evaluated from A to B. And that is also equal to the negative integral of e dot dl from a to b therefore your electric field is actually equal to to that so your electric field is just the negative gradient of v so um in this problem problem um, 20 to 20, you're given the electric field. Uh, one of these is an impossible electrostatic field. Which one is an electrostatic field, A or B? Um, if you get the curl of E, if it is not equal to zero, then that is not an electros, I mean, that is not an electrostatic field if the curl is not equal to zero. But if it is zero, that is an electrostatic field. You can try that. So, and then you can follow some of the problems here. So there's a statement here. Um, a surface over which the potential is constant is called equipotential. Equipotential means at any point in the surface, if the potential is five, at this point, at other points, the potential is also five. So if you get two points and get the potential difference, the potential difference there would be equal to zero because five minus five would be equal to zero or if you have 20 minus 20 is equal to zero. That uh, surface is called equipotential because all points will have the same potential and so the difference uh, any two points that you get would be equal to zero, equal potential. Remember that. What is the advantage of V? <clears throat> what is the advantage of V instead of working on just E? E 
again, as I've said, it's a vector quantity and it has direction. And if you integrate the E, you will have to bother yourself with the directions of the electric field. But V, you work on it, V or the electric potential will be uh, not as messy as E because it doesn't carry any direction. So if you have an integral like this, um, if I could show you, um, um, so it's in a later page, but um, but if you work on with with an integral that's just involving v, then uh, it's really kind of uh, easy. So here, um, uh, by the way, um, with uh, this, with uh, the electric potential being known, um, we know now that the electric fields, the components of the electric fields are actually not independent of each other. They're actually interrelated. The, the X component is related to to the Z component of E. So E, again, is a vector quantity. E is, um, e, is, um, e is a vector quantity. It has uh, EX, EY, and EZ components. So X and EY are interrelated. EX and EZ are also related. EY and EZ are also related. So these are the relationships between the electric fields components of them. So, so now, what if um, I choose, what if I choose a reference point that's not at infinity or not at zero? Another point between zero and infinity, or say uh, O prime what would be the potential difference? <clears throat> if you choose another reference point, um, so here you have a reference point, and this one you could actually write uh, a reference O prime to R. But um, you can write this integral, break the integral to so that your O uh, your O prime um, passes through the inf infinite um, um, point, and then uh, in a, in to complete this, you also start with the infinite point going to R, or in this case, our reference point. So here is your V R. <clears throat> that one from um, zero or from O prime to O will just be another quantity which is a constant K so if you go from V prime B you will have a K here and V prime of A will also have a K so if you subtract k v b minus k uh, minus k plus v a, the elect the potential difference would just be the same because the constant will cancel. So it doesn't matter which point is your reference point if if you're getting the potential difference because the potential difference does not. I care about um, the reference point, but the pot electric potential cares about the reference point, but the potential difference does not. Okay. So you can uh, read this um, slide and then we can make reflections 
out of it. So again, most commonly the potential can be set to zero at infinity, but it also depends on the problem because if you're like um, doing an integration over a charge di distribution that extends to infinity, then the then the electric field at infinity will not be zero. So you have to choose another reference point. Say, for example, a point where the electric field could go to zero, say, at r equal to zero. Or uh, this problem here, uh, you can also set a, a different reference point. Depends on the problem, but most commonly, um, the fields and the and the potential will always go to zero at infinity. That's the most common uh, that ha that happens. Because in the universe, of course, on Earth, you can see a charge distribution. If you go out of the Earth, you go outside the universe, far away from the Earth, you will never feel the Earth anymore. The field of the Earth will be totally lost at infinity. But if you have a problem that's dealing with a continuous charge distribution that's going to infinity um of course uh that um potential would um would not have a reference that's infinity because at infinity it's still infinite or still it still has a value at infinity so um it's not good to use that um, reference point you have to find another point <coughs> So the force, as I've said, um, the force is um, the force follows superposition of uh, forces. So when you have uh, charges, you have many charges. One charge will be able to feel the force. That's the sum of the forces caused by different charges in its surroundings, and of course the electric field would be. Um, would also follow because the force, the electric field will just be the force per unit charge. And um, the, the potential, since you, you're dotting this with DL and integrating, the, if you dot E with DL, you also dot E1, dot DL, E2, dot DL, and so on it will also give you um, V as uh, that's also following the principle of superposition. So here's the statement for that. Um, the potential at any given point is the sum of the potentials due to, the so due to all the source charges separately. By the way, I'd like to go back to some um, some uh, point here. The the electric potential is um, in the units of volts. The unit of electric potential is volts. Um, that's newton meter per coulomb. The electric field is in Newton per coulomb, and the D is in meters. So that's why the units of the electric potential is in uh, Newton meter coulomb. This is in Newton per meter, and this one is in, uh, this is in Newton per coulomb, the E, and the DL is in meters. That's why it's Newton meter per coulomb. And that's the, uh, in the unit of, um, Volts in, in in honor of Alessandro Volta, one of the scientists uh, in electrodynamics. So um, you can go back and read uh, the slides. But this is now the, the last part of the lecture. I'm just going to discuss an example, and then you can study this example. Write it your write it your write it yourself by your hand, and then. Uh, explain with more details and um, 
and with that you'll be able to learn what I'm talking about here in our um, uh, in our lecture. I'm sorry for the blinking. It's actually caused by the the um, it's actually caused by the streaming app that I'm using. Um, I could probably use another streaming app in in, in the future lecture. So um, I'm sorry for that. Um, I hope um, it's um, yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, on the weekend, I will find a new stream up for this uh, for for our lectures. I'm sorry for the blinking. Really. So, in this example, um, find the potential inside and outside a spherical shell of radius R, which carries a uniform surface charge. Set the reference point at infinity. So here you have a spherical shell. It's like a balloon. It's not a solid sphere, but you have a shell, a very thin, uh, it's like a basketball. It's a shell, but the sides, the sides or the surface is very thin where only charge could, um, uh, could um, be confined. In, in a manner that's um, it's uniformly distributed all throughout the surface. So the solution from from Gauss law, <clears throat> the field outside where Q is the total charge of the sphere is equal to um, is equal to that. You, you, we have calculated that um, in the previous example. Uh, that one, but the field inside is zero. Why is the field inside zero? Because you, you don't enclose a charge inside. If you draw a Gaussian surface outside of the spherical shell, you can enclose um, um, the charge, but um, in inside you don't enclose it. You don't enclose a charge. So therefore, your electric field there is zero. So now we're going to calculate the field outside first. Oh, no, we're, we're going to calculate the potential uh, outside first. Okay. The points outside the sphere, the potential, this is the formula for the potential. This is, the, this is the formula for the potential, that one. Uh, of course, uh, you can take uh, 1 or 4 pi epsilon so out of the integral because, um, because uh, that's just a constant. So you're left with Q. Even Q is also a constant. You can take that out of the integral as well. Um, here, you're integrating you're integrating r prime square with respect to dr. Uh, I hope you're not confused with e that dl. The e is in radial direction, and of course, the contribution of the dl would also be in the dr, uh, in the radial direction. So the other two components of d, the dl will contribute nothing to the potential. So. The integral of 1 over r prime square with respect to r prime would just be equal to q over r prime. And that's the negative of uh, q over r prime. So if you evaluate that, it will give you this. It will give you that. So the, the electric field outside the sphere is just... So this is just equal to this. Now, how about calculating the electric field inside? Inside the sphere. So remember that inside the sphere, there's no electric field. 
you only have electric field outside the sphere. Inside the sphere, um, <clears throat> inside the sphere, you have uh, uh, inside the sphere, you have um, the potential. Uh, you you have this. Um, You have this uh, expression for the potential. You have uh, from the in, from infinity to R. This is going from infinity to the surface of the surface of the of the shell, and then from the surface of the shell, you go inside to small R, where R is of course less than. Um, less than, um, less than. Where where R is the small R is less than the big R. So in that region, in uh, of course this is uh, electric field that BL. Uh, in that region where where it's inside the shell, the electric field is zero. So this is zero. So this contributes nothing um, and then you will ha just have to integrate this part and that that part will give you this integral and if you evaluate it will give you this one so at the points where r is less than r the potential there, even if there's no electric field inside the sphere, there is a potential, but and the potential is equal to this one. So even if there's no electric field inside, um, the potential still exists there. And that potential is constant. As you can see, Q is constant, 4 over pi epsilon sub O is constant. And R is also a constant, which is the radius of the spherical shell. So if you get the gradient of that, that would be zero inside. The gradient of that is zero. And the gradient of V, the negative gradient of V, is just equal to the electric field. And the negative gradient of V is just equal to zero. So electric field inside is equal to zero, even if there is a, as an electric potential inside. So there's a statement here. The potential inside the sphere is sensitive to what is going on outside the sphere as well. So the potential inside the sphere will change if there is a neighboring charge that's uh, going to pass by that sphere. So it's like uh, you have a balance. Uh, you have a balanced self. You're sitting there, but if somebody passes by you, you will feel the presence of that person because um, somehow it changes the field. Your, your, your balance, uh, your physical balance, it changes your physical balance. So that's why you'll be able to feel the presence of somebody that's passing by you. So, um, so anyway, uh, if you have questions, you can ask questions, and then uh, just take note of these problems. I'll just uh, uh, you can take a screenshot of the problems so that you can do them at your at your convenience. So um, that that ends for uh, this uh, lecture. So just uh, wait for the assessment uh, of this lecture. So in the meantime, you can review, take notes of, of, um, of the lecture. You can, um, you can, uh, by the way, you can, what can say, uh, what do I say? Uh, you can, um, you can answer the assessment by yourself or because the, the, the questions in the assessment will just be um, will just be repeated but there are there are some changes but there they will be most of them will be repeated.
So thank you very much for your uh, attendance, and I hope that you learned something today in our lecture. And next meeting, we'll be discussing about um, Ozon's equation. Thank you.